for that. Uh, what's the coverage of these? What are some things that um, we should add to that list? And finally, the last one, um, as you can see, is on data. Um, and really, the, the, I think there are two parts of this. Uh, one of it is um, with vulnerability data, what kind of analysis or what kind of like um, information can we mine out of it? But also the other question is like, what is that, is that missing data that will be critical for us to be able to do more analysis on that? And like, what are the fields that, that, that we want on that? So, um, in the end of this, I think we want like we want to gather all the the different discussion points. Uh, we will probably we will share this with the entire group, um, and you know we will follow up as as accordingly. Um, just want to get a sense um, who's interested in what topics. So let's start with process. Who's interested in talking about process? Process of life cycle of vulnerabilities. All right. Um, how about gaps in vulnerability identifiers? Okay. How about vulnerability data information? Okay. This is a big overlapping group of people <laughs> that are talking about different things. Um, so usually how this works is we split out into three groups and talk about it. Um, but Everyone that's interested in all trees seem to be overlapping, <laughs> overlapping pretty much. Um, so I think what we can do maybe is um, we have until about 30 minutes. Maybe we can spend 10 minutes each on a topic, and then we can go from there. Um, so maybe we'll start with the most popular one, which was data. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna set a timer. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm. I'll, I'll get Eric to switch off the mic if he talks too much. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's start with the data stuff. Um, so, uh, Shripa, can you help with the facilitation? Um, I think we're gonna really just open the floor. I will take some notes as you talk, and then I will see online whether there are any anyone that wants to participate. Um, and Eric, maybe you can get another mic as well. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay, hi everyone. So let's start with the analysis of vulnerability data topic then. So yeah, we have, when we get the, uh, so so what, how do we define, what do we define vulnerability data to be? Any Anyone, at CV, is that uh, the vulnerability data, everything that comes with it, the CVSS score, the uh, description, what package is impacted, what version is impacted, and how do you fix it, right? Uh, CWE is there, so in short, like how do you want to see like what is the vulnerability data? Let's start with that. Uh, so just to repeat, just looking for generically what we think vulnerability mm. data is? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, just because it kind of aligned with the presentation I gave earlier, uh, vulnerability data at its core, we have a lot of derived data points that everybody cares about. And they're all very important and can be used for all sorts of analysis, but what has happened, uh, at least in, in my region in the last five, 10 years, is there's been a lot of effort to start providing all of these derived data points and very little effort on actually providing any foundational data about how those derived data points came to be. There's no, there's very little ability uh, from downstream consumers to be able to validate that any of the derived data points are actually accurate. Everything eventually uh, is starting to be put into kind of these black box, uh, well, these black box efforts where you don't have to worry about how we got the data, you don't have to worry about how we got there, it's fine, everything's great, it's definitely not wrong unless you prove us wrong, but here's this other stuff that you should really use. And that's uh, useful in the short term, but in the long term, it makes it very difficult to be able to do any larger scale analytics on vulnerability information. Can you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and this might be, a, what are, so I agree that, it, you know, former academics, so would love to roll around in data all day. Um, but the, 
what are some of the sources of the bad data? Is it just because T certs are doing their job and don't want to fill out all the forms in the drop downs, or is it that there are actually systemic biases that are coming in from the data generation? Why don't we have all of the fields that you've asked for? Uh, so, well, I can't answer all of that. Uh, what I would say is, exactly, right? Uh, no, so what I, I guess the, the, the point I'm making is if the people who are producing the data say, my downstream users care about actions that they need to take in the next 36 hours, so you fancy pants people in the US government that care about data, and I'm one of them, um, you're just gonna have to either write your own damn data or pay someone to do it because we've got jobs. And so I guess what I'm, I'm trying to figure out is how, is there a bias in how we're collecting the data that fundamentally undermines our ability to do, to have community level gleanings, or is it just we haven't built the right tools so that it's easy for people who are doing their jobs to put the data in? Right, so uh, what I would say is there's obviously going to be biases naturally from every organization that's providing information. Everybody's driven to provide data for different reasons, usually money, uh, but there's lots of other reasons, reputation, et cetera, to do it. So uh, there's definitely a driving force to kind of just skip the foundational data and just jump straight to the results. Uh, so I wouldn't say there's that's wrong from like a, an immediacy perspective. Uh, but as far as being able to uh, make sure that they aren't missing important data points or things like that, I would say that that's because there's a relative void in an expected approach that's necessary to get even what's universally considered some sort of baseline. Uh, if, if that wasn't the case, we would have things look more similar than they do today as far as vulnerability reports go. And right now, it's kind of all over the place. Okay, so we have, uh, um, yeah, that's, you want to finish your thought, or do you have uh, something to say? I don't know, we can skip it, okay. Um, so Emily has a question. She asks, what are the fields we want that allow us to better analyze the information presented? Could you actually repeat that again? Um, so, what are the fields? What are the fields that would allow us to better analyze the information presented? What kinds of things do we want out of the data? Right. So, um, so there's obviously the the, the minimum uh, that we require in terms of figuring out exactly what is affected and what versions are being affected, and this needs, needs to be done in a consistent. Um, Scale uh, machine readable way, right? Um, but I think there's actually, because of the nature of open source, there's a missed opportunity here. Um, if we can kind of tie vulnerability management closer to open source development workflows, say for example, if every vulnerability had the commit that fixed the bug, or, or even better, if we could kind of have some sort of automation to, to perform automated bisections to get the range from when we first introduced the vulnerability to when we fix the vulnerability, I think there's a lot of metadata here that we can automate on. So one possible example is if we just uh, naively match uh, vulnerabilities to something in the SBOM, we may get a lot of false positives, right? This is the whole point of VEX. But I think that if we have, say, the patch, um, given the open nature of open source, we could potentially kind of automate the process of figuring out, given the vulnerability, what code part needs to be hit to actually um, uh, to hit this vulnerability, and uh, that kind of enables us to have some automation around automatically excluding um, a lot of these uh, vulnerability scanning, giving us false positives, right? So I think there there is a lot of things we can do um, because we have open source code that we can rely on that we can do more automation and help give better results for. Uh, Episode, yeah. yeah, just uh, one thought, right? So uh, in most cases, the CV fix is not part of like one commit. There can be like multiple commits that goes into fixing some vulnerabilities, iteration, and uh, so do you, uh, yeah. Uh, something I want to add on that. Yeah. Many reporters have no incentive to give us good data. That needs to change somehow. I don't know how to change that. So a thought on what kind of matters when it comes to the data. 
Am I affected? How bad is it? What can I do to fix it? And that kind of what comes to mind. So making it easy to identify what components are affected, if for whatever reason there's an exception to whether or not you're affected, what kind of vulnerability is it, and having that be easy to understand, and yeah. I um, spoke with Kate in the GitHub Security Lab about this, <laughs> like, or the GitHub Security Advisors database about this, like adding financial incentives around good data, right? Like paying people bounties for like writing up good reports and stuff like that for like, th you know, thank you, you did a nice job. You included like all of this information. Here's a little bit of an incentive to do this again in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing that I've run into around issues is people don't like the answer of this CV exists and there is no patched version. Like the industry kind of like comes up with fake versions to say this is patched in a certain thing when it's actually not. And I was like, I, I had an example of a vulnerability in Google's Lava where I said, you know, they deprecated this method in a certain version and everybody said, oh, that meant that it was fixed in this version. And I'm like, no, they just deprecated the method. They didn't actually remove it or fix the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, a quick add on to like the incentive part too. I wonder if some part of that is providing incentives, but also kind of to that is just making it the process easier so that there's less disincentive to go through the process. If it's super easy, I just put in some information, it's a drop down, done. From a maintainer perspective, that's pretty doable. But if it's like, I don't know what the heck any of this means, it's a long process, that's when you start getting really junk data if they just throw in whatever. Um, sorry, briefly here. Um, a possibly fundamental issue I've, I've come across is, you know, sure, you sit down and pick, pick your fields, right, and, and create a format and create paths to the things you want, and I bet you we'd all come up with pretty similar things, but, uh, and, you know, CV is guilty of this, right, so there's a description field. Well, how do you, what, what is the machine-readable version of, I don't know, local privilege escalation, you know, encoding this stuff in the machine-readable, like, that's a whole language problem that is completely not completely not solved? Have you guys gotten anywhere on that? All right, I didn't see your, I, I couldn't come to the talk, but. So th there's a real issue with like, we can write prose that humans can kind of, ex human experts can uh, sort of understand. And there's a whole bunch, it's a, it's a complicated thing to, to encode, I guess, in the first place, fundamentally difficult. Otherwise, I think we would have made some progress um, by now on that. No offense to anyone's efforts to do that. Yeah, I think uh, we went into the different topics. We, we are uh, finding the gaps, right? What, what are the gaps? But let's say we are all the data uh, providers, right? So what are the analysis? What are the new things we can do with this stuff that we are not doing today? We have previous experts that we, we were ranking and all of this stuff. So what is, let's say, what all the information that we are talking about, we have that to fill the gap. You know, what new we can do? What new analy analytics we can do on top of that? Well, I think when it comes to the what we can do new to help address this, I think Art kind of touched on it there, was making it machine-readable data rather than having it be like prose that a, an expert can go through and understand. This has to be automated. Machines have to be able to understand it. And I think that's probably the next step there. So from my experience, at least, it seems like there is uh, just like a general lack of knowledge about this kind of information so the people that are that want to give it maintainers have i'd say at least in my community more support than maybe researchers or reporters do a lot of them are very well intentioned and they just can't find the way to do it they don't know who to contact they don't know what information to give or how to give it in a useful manner so i think if we more overarchingly give more support to these groups still more support to maintainers but definitely more support to security researchers that are doing and finding this information making it easier for them to share it and give it in a way that is usable and actionable um, would be really really helpful something that we're passionate about that we're working on we're working on that in open ssf as well trying to give just more support for researchers from the start um, earlier in the process
so I, I think one of the one of the things that I was talking about is kind of like looking at the batch stuff, right? Uh, uh, and like like product like stack stack stuff or something like that to be able to detect like which are the vulnerable functions am I calling them? Um, do we think that this information is useful? And I guess is it encodable at all? So the the question is, can we encode like the call graph and that kind of stuff into the IDs? In, in a way that we can do that analysis, yeah. or, or whether it's the right place to do it. So I think that data is encodable. Um, utility, I don't know. Um, if you're saying you're affected by this function, what what is your action? Do you still just update the package, or is there something else? Um, as far as I'm concerned, that's an open question. I haven't seen good use of that data, but maybe. I guess where that could come in is, am I affected? As opposed to, yeah, right. So if you use this function and that's the vulnerable function. Sorry, an assumption there is um, the data would have to be very targeted in that case. And I feel sorry I didn't address that, but um, given that certainty, I, I, it's somewhat doubtful. Yeah, so I think getting this call graph information is definitely very challenging to, to do very perfectly. But I think if we can just get rid of, say, 50% of what's false positives, that's that's a very good result already, even with an imperfect you know, uh, algorithm to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Where did my question go? Oh. Sounds like templates of expected content is needed. That can be easily converted in this uh, converted mach machine readable format. Perhaps doing this in the command line is a utility. I don't know whether that was a question or that was not. Sorry, I'm again. I guess maybe that's where it was made. So something I think we're kind of talking about too is there's varying levels of vulnerability information. There's what I would consider the most basic amount of vulnerability information that you can share with description, what the issue is, what you can do about it, where it's fixed, what's vulnerable. On top of that is a lot of other extraneous but very useful information like what uh, function is affected um, and a lot of very useful data that is harder to get. I love that, I want to do that, I want that information but we can't even get the basic information always right. <laughs> so I think we need to fix that first, personally. And I say this as somebody who has a product that supports giving vulnerable function information. So just please still give me that when you have it. But I, I would also personally greatly appreciate like better description. I'm like, let's get the basics right first. I personally have experience with, um, uh, as an example, JetBrains, when they issue CVEs for their vulnerabilities and their stuff, they are like one line, and that is it. Like they don't include very much information, um, and they have a link to a private issue tracker that they never make public. Um, so I end up having to do my own disclosures of their stuff as a researcher with my with their CVEs. Um, it's annoying, but yeah, I, d I don't know how to fix that or like encourage the like upstream. Like the main the, the maintainer that's asking for the CV to like give MITRE more information. If we reach the horror story part of the day, uh, um, many if not the majority of ICS vendors actually put their advisories behind their customer paywalls, um, which is you know very very bad. And again, that's, yeah. Yeah, I think we'll move to the next topic now. I think we could partly cover that, but uh, yeah, gaps in the vulnerability identifier, right? Specific, oh, okay, <laughs> we are into the ICS. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, can we first, I mean, we know the vulnerability identifier, if you can yes. just say w how, how we are doing it today. Yeah. So. Um, gaps in identifying the vulnerabilities. So uh, identifying the vulnerabilities, usually the researcher has to know, like either the researcher or the receiver has to know that a CV needs to get assigned, right? That's the pretty normal way that disclosure occurs. Um, that 
Disclosure that occurs that actually causes positive impacts to the downstream users. Usually it has a CVE number and signs it in, in the intuitive. Um, one of the issues that has occurred is like there are people that find vulnerabilities that don't know about the CVE system or don't know about the disclosure system. And so I found vulnerabilities in JavaScript libraries, for example, that like some guy was just finding a bunch of vulnerabilities and issuing open issues and like nobody was getting a CVE. And I'm like, that's a lot of remote code execution right there. Um, uh, other examples are that I have run into a lot um, historically is I have run into cases where both Google and my, uh, no, Google and GitHub have had vulnerabilities disclosed to them in their bug bounty program, for example, that impacted open source software. And people talked about it at Black Hat and DEF CON and been like, oh yeah, like I made $10,000 out of this vulnerability disclosure. And you go back and look at the actual vulnerabilities in the software that was used in the exploit chain and nobody, neither the maintainer nor the GitHub or Microsoft, or sorry, GitHub or um, Google actually took that vulnerability and turned it around and said, hey maintainer, you had a vulnerability that like was a reason that we had a $10,000 bug bounty payout. I'm like, what? Yeah, so uh, would you characterize it that this is a lack of education from like whoever is reporting, they don't know the vulnerable disclosure process? Well, the reporter knows how to disclose to the company that's vulnerable. Like I've talked to their maintainers and but like there's no follow up by like I think it's like a passing the buck sort of thing. Like neither side is taking responsibility for actually getting the vulnerability fixed in like the upstream component that was part of the exploit chain. I guess we'll respond to this, but I think you're kind of targeting like the life cycle of the vulnerability versus well, the other no, it's, it's like identifying it, like actually like identifying it insofar as it like actually gets assigned, like okay. the CVE so that actually disclosure actually occurs. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other point that I want to make is somebody did a great talk, I don't remember who, but about like the idea of scraping GitHub commits and like finding vulnerabilities in hidden in the rough, like these, like this looks like a CVE, but it might not be, oh hey, that actually is. like. People are doing good work around like, I think SNCC does that too, where they like, they have like a feed of CVEs where they like go, oh, that's actually might look like a commit that fixes a vulnerability, maybe it should get a CVE number assigned. So more people doing that and finding those actual vulnerabilities in the fix feed um, is useful. I thought about this from the perspective of GitHub where there could be like a banner that says create a pull request instead of creating a pull request say, hey, the commit that you just pushed looks like it might fix a vulnerability. Do you want to open a GSFA? Like that's like a, a really easy step towards like encouraging maintainers to do that. Yes, any other gaps you see in the vulnerability identifier? So one thing I found is we don't have vulnerability when uh, in software goes out of support or out of life, right? So we have that, do we need that? Because I have talked about this. The I, I've brought this to the CVE board and they have said that they do not want to issue a CVE number for a piece of software purely on the basis that it is no longer maintained. Uh, yeah. Sure, okay. <laughs> so no, yeah, sorry, I misunderstood something you d discussed earlier. So the fact that something is maintained is or is not a vulnerability, or it does or doesn't get a CVE is one question. That's what you just said, right? Yes, yeah, that, so there's a CWE called this, that basically the CWE covers, this, <laughs> this package is not maintained, but it's not something that the CVE board wants to issue a CVE number for. Right, so uh, that, that sounds, <laughs> so knowing your software is no longer maintained, very important, no one ever argues with that, right? Knowing you're out of security support, important security state to have in mind and, right, okay. Um, everything gets a CVE then? Because everything will be out of date? I mean, I... Eventually, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, so I, I here's the, re the reason that I think CVE is the right thing is because it's a tool that works to get people to update, right? It's a, it's a flag that is, yep, a, it's is a functional, yeah. it's a functional flag that already tells you this version is not safe in some way and people would see it and be like, okay, now we need to do some action on it. Right, it it would feed into the existing pipeline that all these other no, stuff, all this other stuff right. does, and, and the similar discussion in the malware or malicious software or injected software. It's a it's a slight abuse of the V and CVE, but if it's working and it gets people to pay attention, maybe the argument is, is in favor. Um, I just wanted to say, and it's a d I misunderstood at first. You can issue a CVE. So, uh, you make software. I report to you. You're like, I don't support that software. 
that can still get a CD and, yeah. and it gets flagged as no longer supported, but that still can get a CD. Got it. The difference is this thing is just not maintained anymore. Don't use it. That in itself gets an ID is the question yes, you have. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And the board was said, no, we would not do that. And, and for a number of, I think that's, that is an important thing that every P cert that I've talked to has sort of flagged at some point another attempt with. Um, I don't think the solution is to shoehorn it into the vulnerability ecosystem for a number of reasons. W one of them is, is the point we've already heard, which is um, right. the vulnerability management management ecosystem is now like eight years old because vulnerability management is now so overloaded that you need to have a special separate product to manage your vulnerability management team. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that are, right, there, there are gonna be a lot of times where I'm going to make a advised decision to use it. What we need to do is help the maturing organizations realize what's out of date, uh, rather than, and, and, and sort of help them prioritize that, and there's gonna be a lot of metadata on that. So I think this is one of the things where GSD, so the Global Security Database, could potentially step in, is creating a new type of identifier that's specifically for say, the maintenance status of a package. Um, so rather than trying to shoehorn it into the vulnerability space, have just a new space that's specifically the maintenance status, and if you want to consume it, you can. If you don't care, ignore it. Yeah, ex I mean, the, the point is essentially to have this user, right, to no notify there somewhere that yeah, you are using certain particular version, which is not supported. I mean, it, it may not be CD, but some way to notify that. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to point out, uh, some databases do already include this. Uh, the Rust Protect database has a number of advisories for deprecated products. Um, yeah. Something to integrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, we need it across all the ecosystem, not just the Rust. So a consistent way for people to look up and build automation for them there. So, Any, uh, yeah. so this gets at the question of what is deprecated. Um, if you have a piece of stable software that hasn't seen an update in a year, is that deprecated? Or does it we then have to opt into deprecation? Or I I this is hard, and so I don't have an answer. End of life and end of support are two very different things, and your comment on the open source world is I think incredibly valid as well. Use case, I found a vulnerability in a piece of Java software that the maintainers weren't responding at all and eventually had to get Snick get a CV for me and it's like, it's, I mean, they're not, the maintainers are not there to say this is end of life or not maintained anymore, but it's very clearly that I can't get in touch with any of the maintainers. Part of our work through the open SSF is we can encourage better project and maintainer behaviors to illustrate in it's a best practice to state what your project life cycle is, how you will, res will or will not respond based off of the age or state of the software. So we can do that through both the best practice of working group through the education push and the new um, open source cert effort to potentially kind of get the out and in the minds of maintainers to help part of the problem. It doesn't have an identifier, doesn't uh, factor into your identifier problem, but we can start to teach better behavior and try to encourage that in, in the different communities. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Do you see any other gap in we need to identify this something in, we need identifier for some other open source software? Uh, do you think we need, uh, like, just like you say, end of support or end of life, we need some identifier for that. Do you see any other gap, like we need some sort of identifier for cer certain characteristics of software? And, and you might never get that from a maintainer, but we could hold our commercial suppliers accountable to having some type of identifier statement. So I, I made a passing joke, but it actually could work, which is for, for projects, we have a, a project-based deadnet switch, which is, right, at a certain point, if there's no alive ping, you move it to some sort of other status, and then I'm like, well, actually, you know, we, we've had that over the last year, and it's DNS, right? It's the, when your domain expires, it's a pretty good sign that your project is not maintained. And one quick addition to that is, um, maybe rather than explicitly saying, this is when it is considered dead, this is when it's no longer maintained, 
you can see the data. This is the last time we saw a response from this project, and then let the consumers of the data decide how long is too long. I, I don't know if that'd be. So uh, I want to roll back a little bit. One gap that I see a lot is in severity rankings. The CVSS system is not well suited for libraries, um, which get embedded in many places. And CVSS guidance says to assume a worst case scenario, which is hard when a library can be in a child's toy or a pacemaker. Um, I would love to see a new severity ranking system designed for libraries first. Yeah, anyone any thought like what could be the new ranking system or prioritization system? To, for to be clear, I don't necessarily mean a new one, but even a parallel one, but something probably from MITRE. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, CVSS is maintained by FIRST. There is a special interest group, SIG, the uh, special interest group at FIRST that maintains that. You do not have to be a member of FIRST, which is to, to be part of the CVSS SIG. And some folks here, Christopher at least, I think I am still, are members of the SIG. Yes, and I, uh, I actually think I would get in trouble if I didn't clarify this. Uh, the CVSS, at least V3.1 guidance, does not say to use the worst case scenario. It actually explicitly says uh, to score based off the most reasonably achievable impact. Uh, so uh, it's been a point of debate in the SIG itself, too. Understood. Yeah, Is it worth having explicitly an unknown? No? no? Unknowns make everything worse. Uh, again, not to be a downer too much, library, uh, microprocessor, these root components, there's not, there may not be a way to say it. So it may be that the way I use libpng, right, it's critical, and the way you use it is not. And it may, the severity, prioritization, risk analysis may have to occur closer to the end user or the end product and service. And the library is like, there's a, there's a thing in the library, but what does that mean to you? go a couple hops downstream. I'm not sure there's a way to do it at the library level. But, but I could be wrong, of course. It's always good to flag when someone else is tackling the similar problem. Uh, one of the things that the SBOM community is discovering, and in fact, the SBOM Everywhere Workstream from OpenSF is trying to tackle this, is there is a difference between thinking about uh, dependency graphs of a repo and dependency graphs of a build. Uh, and so, I'm not sure they're any closer to the solution, but as, as we sort of think through it, that might be a good thing to track, which is repo versus built. And going back just a little bit one step, one of the things that we were um, talking about is that it's very dependent on maybe how you're using the library. Something that does try to address this and I don't think is really used at all is the environmental metrics within CVSS, which is exactly for that. But the issue is that's not visible to anybody other than yourself. Most organizations or anybody that is using the environmental metrics does that internally. They're not necessarily sharing that. Also, why would they in some cases? So I think there is, there is some support for that there. It's just not either widely used or visible in any way. All right, we are coming close on time. Um, so I think the last thing I wanna get folks to do is if you can go into the buff session there's a bunch of hack MVs. Go to the one on um, just any, uh, I guess the one on the data analysis since we talked about that the most. Put in your name um, and so that, you know, we can follow out the discussion and bring the right folks back in. Awesome. Yes, uh, Should we be able to edit? You should be able, you, if you just hit the middle button on the top, top left, left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they can do the markdown, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I think we'll close for now. Um, I guess if you want to stick around and chat. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Rupert.